All right, so here next up is going to be uh, Doug Sani. So take it away, Doug. OK, thanks. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, OK, yes. good. Um, so I'm Doug Sandy. I'm chief architect of the Hyperskill team within Artisan Embedded Technologies. Uh, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with Artisan, we are a leading supplier of power solutions for everything from consumer devices all the way up to, obviously, data center uh, devices as well. Um, throughout my career, I've been um, uh, involved in, in uh, two main things. Uh, one is about um, half of my career I've been in technology office of uh, various companies. And I have also, through that, been involved in helping build open ecosystems. So it's kind of with, with that background and, and interest level that I'm coming with this presentation. I'm not going to be presenting um, new groundbreaking uh, answers to questions, but uh, really uh, we have some questions within Artisan that we think are appropriate for the, com uh, the community to be looking at. And we're looking for, for uh, other participants who are interested in helping answer some of these same questions with us. So um, first slide. Great. This is that, by the way, is a very special slide uh, uh, wipe technique that we get to look at today. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, in my the abstract for this talk, uh, really what we see is, is uh, highlighted in that red bar there. Uh, next generation server net and networking architectures combined with increasing demand for data center operational and capital efficiencies put extreme pressure on continued improvement of the rack power subsystem. Okay. Um, actually, before I go to the next slide, I'd be interested, I shared a little about, bit about me. Um, who out there is, is a, a designer of power supplies or power, power uh, solutions? Okay. Who is involved in integration of power solutions, like at the rack level? Okay, a few integrators. And how about users of power supplies within... Okay, a few users, good. And who is maybe in the wrong room and just realizing it? <laughs> okay. You don't have to raise your hand. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. I like starting with trends. Now, this is part of my, my um, technology office heritage. Um, I like looking at trends because they tell us where things are probably going. Right? You can't predict the future, but you can get a pretty good idea of where things are going. The first trend is is Moore's Law. We're all familiar with it. Uh, Gordon Moore stated that, that, um, that the number of transistors that can be economically produced, I'm getting whiplash here, economically produced in, in a, a piece of silicon is going to double you know, roughly every two years. Okay. Uh, the consensus is out. Moore's Law is dead. Right? Um, and <clears throat> This doesn't mean that we can't get further improvements in semiconductor die shrinks. It just means the economics around it have fallen apart. So what we can expect is that the server chip manufacturers that have relied upon ever smaller transistor sizes to fuel performance improvements over time, they're going to have a harder time doing that. Okay. That means two things from a server chip perspective. Okay. Number one, uh, you can probably expect more chips to be added to the servers, which is going to be, mean higher power, okay? higher power per server chip. You can also probably expect some specialized instructions to be added to try to offset that. But we believe the general trend will be processor chips and servers in general are going to start consuming more power. Okay. Next slide. OK, the second major trend, and it's related, because the processor performance curve is not going to continue at the same trajectory, most likely, is adjunct processors are making their, their uh, way to the scene. So uh, GP, GPUs have been one area where we see adjunct processing, but also FPGAs, where we're going to see a, a whole new series of, of uh, adjunct processors. And while they, they do improve the performance of the server, 
they come at the expense of additional power for that server. Because if you add an adjunct processor, the power per server then goes up. So the bottom line is we expect the power per server to go up. Now what does this mean for us? Let's, next slide. Okay. So this map shows different scenarios. Let's assume that the power per server increases. Okay. And we have a decision point. Do we want to keep the power per rack the same? Right? That's the top, um, top path. The bottom path is, do we want to increase the maximum power per rack? Both of those have challenges. Both have advantages and disadvantages. And I'm not going to suggest that there's a uniform answer for the industry. I think it's going to be vary by operator and probably vary by installation. But we can see if we keep the maximum rack power the same, that means you're going to have to have fewer servers per rack, right? If each server costs you know, more power to run, it's fewer servers per rack. And in order to, to make your performance curve of the data center, the capacity curve of the data center, keep on the same trajectory, you're going to need more racks, right? Because fewer servers per rack, you just need more racks to do that. So that, that creates rack sprawl. The, the bottom one is you increase the rack um, rack power, but now you've got cooling problems to deal with and additional rack power density challenges. So that might not work for, for people who are trying to keep you know, free air cooling um, and no, no heat exchangers within their system. So um, you can see this touches not just the power within the rack, but very quickly impacts the operational models of the data center. Right? And that's why I think it's exciting to talk about this in this forum. Let's go to the next slide. Now, here's some of the questions we have to ask, right? If, if we have a, a, a change coming, an inflection point coming in how we're doing power, it makes sense to ask the question of, well, what does OpenRack 3.0 power look like, right? Maybe it's not an incremental change. So one of the questions we have is, you know, what about, are there ways to reduce stranded power within the rack? For those of you who don't know that term, stranded power is power that the capacity is there in the rack, but you can't count it on it uh, for use by your IT equipment because it's there for purposes like redundancy or you've over-provisioned the supply just in case you hit a power peak, right? Um, so in this particular example, you see uh, uh, three PSUs across the top, three BBUs uh, along the bottom. Uh, one third of that is there for redundancy, or you've got about 50% of, of, of the power, 50% um, stranded power in that, that uh, rack. Um, by reducing stranded power, you can dramatically reduce the, the cost of your power infrastructure. So that's the first question. Um, next. Um, you know, this has already come up, you know, improving efficiency. You know, uh, and, you know, better efficiency is always great, right? I mean, as long as it doesn't come at extra cost, as long as it doesn't um, push on other design parameters that you're trying to balance. And uh, if in this, this future of rack power, we're actually looking at increasing the power density of the shelf, okay, we might have a challenge of a balancing power, higher power density and higher power efficiency at the time. So um, as a general rule, if you're pushing the highest power density within a shelf, um, you're, you're going to have to give some on power efficiency. Likewise, if you're pushing the highest energy efficiency or power efficiency in your PSUs, you're going to have to give some on your density. Okay. So this is another area where, you know, Again, the operational models come into play. Which is, which is the most important factor, right? As power suppliers, we can, we can tune this dial, turn the dial any direction that makes sense, but um, you know, we're, we're gonna have to look at that. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, along with power density, you know, we wanna probably use as much rack space as we possibly can uh, for, for this. Uh, so this is by making a larger power station, you can reduce your volumetric density of power, and then you can push up your efficiency along with your, your capacity within the power shelf. But there are other trade-offs, like uh, 
this, uh, this particular shelf, the, the depth of that shelf was, was chosen so that there's enough cable bend radius for, for the shelf. Right? Um, so again, more, more trade-offs. Uh, next slide. This one, um, can we utilize the stored energy in other ways? There's, there are, uh, there's local energy storage within the shelf. It's there primarily to, uh, to hold up the system uh, in the, the event of catastrophic input feed failure. Right? So you're, you're waiting for your diesel generators to come up. You hold up the power using the, the battery backup. The diesel generators come up. and the batteries start charging again. So it's, it's just a fail safe there. But if you have the batteries in there with some changes to the system, you can, you can use that spare battery capacity potentially to, to do things like peak shaving, right? Um, not a new concept, um, but not one that's currently imp implemented. And there, there are trade-offs with this. Um, it does unlock some of the, potentially unlock some of the stranded power that you might have in over-provisioning of your PSUs, but it has implications to the life of the batteries that were, are within the, uh, the BBUs, right? And how often will power peaks occur? You know, again, another discussion um, that's, that's important to have and shouldn't be made unilaterally. Okay, and certainly increases the, the system complexity as well. Okay, so next slide. Okay, um, vendor interoperability. This one is, um, I like saying that, that um, making interoperability simple is really hard. Okay. That's the, the crux of this slide. But you know, interoperability, if greater interoperability in an ecosystem generally is a win for everyone. Um, but getting there is really hard. Right now, the, the level of interoperability that we have within the open rack community really is at the rack level. Right? You wouldn't expect to, to uh, get a rack from, from one integrator or one, one vendor and um, put in a, a, a bus bar system and a power shelf from two different vendors. Right? And I think those that are, are in the integration space recognize how difficult it is to take this, this uh, um, multiple vendors and make them, them work together. Now, this community has done a great job at moving the ball forward. Right? I think we're, we're this, this uh, open rack is really a tremendous platform for, uh, for innovation in the, the hyperscale and data center space. The question is, does it make sense to start looking at interoperability at the lower levels? Can, can we make a bus bar from anyone work with a rack from anyone else? Can we, um, can we make a power station from someone work with PSUs from someone else? And as we get down to that level, you know, can we make PSUs work with someone else's BBUs, right? And at every step along the way, there's, there may be ecosystem benefits, but there's also challenges for this group of people here, right? Uh, because again, interoperability, making it simple is really hard. Okay, last slide, I think. Okay, so, you know, those were the, the, some of the, the topics that we see at Artisan that we probably need to, to discuss. I mean, the management also came up. You know, what is the right schema for this? And what, what's the right uh, method of managing the shelf? What features and functions do we need to expose to management? Um, that's a, another topic that I think we need to cover. But basically, I think the challenge is, is before us, the call to action. Uh, I think the time is now to start wrestling with some of these questions. Um, while, while OpenRack 2.0 is, is uh, enjoying a, a long and stable, healthy life, uh, we can, we can uh, answer some of these other questions in the background. So, um, I, let's do one more slide here, actually. OK. I do have my contact information. Uh, in the slide deck. If you want to ping me, you know, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to answer. You know, we've spoken about how do we get a community discussion going on this topic. Um, so you can uh, approach uh, the, the uh, work group leaders on that also. Um, but you know, we think the time is now to kick off the discussion. Yeah, and we're not, obviously probably not going to have enough time to 
resolve all that today yes. in the next five minutes or so. Um, but that's definitely, uh, you know, if there's some interest in kind of taking on this topic, right, we can definitely spend a lot more time at the, on the next, you know, engineering workshop, right, right. kind of really taking a, a deeper look into these trends and, uh, you know, kind of seeing where we want to go from here. So um, if you definitely got some interest in kind of Discussing in more detail the, the questions that uh, that Doug's bringing up, um, you know, let let us know and we can we can set that up so we have a little bit more time to discuss it in a, uh, a little bit more depth than what we've got right yeah. now. So, uh, we have some time for questions yeah, and discussion we got a now. Yeah, so. few minutes right now. Yeah. Are you still planning on using like a PM bus interface for the OCT power supplies? So, so. Let me turn that back. The question was, are, <laughs> am I still planning on using the PM bus interface for the PSUs within the shell? And I guess I would ask the question to the community, you know, what is the right interface for the PSUs within the PowerShell? Right? I'm, I'm not proposing a solution today. I'm just saying these are the things. So it sounds like that's a topic, right? Is that, that's of interest, is to look at the communications between the PSUs and the, and the power station itself. Um, so. And between the power station. Yeah, and between the power station and the DSIM or the rack management, yeah. So I guess I would envision and, and um, that at least from the power station upward, um, there's going, we're going to have to support whatever the facility operator requires. I do think uh, Redfish is gaining a lot of traction um, and we may need to, to integrate discussions with, with uh, DMTF in terms of how we do that upper layer. Um, in terms of the lower layer, uh, I think that depends on you know, what level of interoperability we're, we're shooting for also. Okay. Yeah? I got a question about uh, what's the size Let's of use the power microphones power. that they can, they can hear. So what's the size of the power blocks that you see the, the PSU is running at going forward? Okay, Maybe me, we, we've got two and a half kilowatt, three kilowatt, three point three kilowatt. Uh, you know, keep going. Where where is the break point as an architect? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. I, I certainly see. There's two things that, that dictate that, right? There's how many power blocks are there in the shelf, right? And personally, I believe, you know, we need to have more power blocks within the shelf, um, as a general rule, because that that reduces the the amount of um, stranded capacity that we have in there. In terms of, of the power capacity within, uh, within those um, power modules, you know, um, I would expect you know, we're going to need to, it, we're going to need to have a roadmap on these things that probably increases, uh, I'm going to give you a broad range, uh, be, between 15 to 50 percent every couple of years. Um, and hopefully closer to the 15 percent, right? I mean, 50 percent. Uh, um, there might be an initial uh, stair step uh, in terms of the, the power, power uh, uh, bump. I think the, the operators really answer that question, though, because it, it's in their, it's their operational deployment model that, that dictates that. I mean, it's sort of the merge between the, what the technology can do and the operational models that are being So it kind of gets into the chicken and egg, though, because on the IT side, they're you know, traditionally you've got the power in the server, and so whatever the server dictates is what the power, power supply in the server would be. Now we move into no man's land, where the power is distributed into or aggregated into a shelf level, which the uh, infrastructure guys aren't touching, and then the IT guys aren't touching. So now it's left up to the architects of well, the power systems. And that's why we're posing the question to this community, because here, you know, we can't solve this in a vacuum, right? The, the operators need to, to be able to, to speak up to what their operational models are. If we, if we for instance, let's say we, we uh, design a power shelf that can do, you know, with all the modules in it, can do um, 100 kilowatts. Okay, so now you can have a 100 kilowatt rack. Yeah, you know, score for, for the power guys, right? <laughs> okay, but it doesn't really work well if it requires you know, massive amounts of, of HVAC cooling in the facility and liquid to the, the power shelf or who knows what, and the operators don't want to do that, right? Uh, so that's why I think you know, that's the value of open communities is, is we get to discuss that here, you know, and, and I think we just need to, to propose and we bring as, as 
power supply designers, we kind of know what the roadmap for that is, as the operators kind of know their roadmap for being cooling capacity. So, so I mean, this kind of leads into the discussion of, you know, what, what should we be talking about as a community? And it brings about the, really the need to have a working session that incorporates not just the power, not just the rack, the facilities, because of the cooling, it brings in the IT space as well because of the uh, different types of computing that they're using and the demand for the power so that we work together as a integrated group. Right now we're still fragmented where power is working on power, facility infrastructure is working on facility infrastructure, and then IT and storage are all doing their own thing, which makes it very challenging for those of us in the power domain that's uh, in, in this no man's land. So I would suggest that that's an, a great topic for okay. the OCP. Super. Yeah, thank you for a very good explanation. It's uh, I tried to <clears throat> change the questions of the previous person because you are a presenter of industry from one of the companies who is doing some efficient power supply in the world. Yeah, and you know generally it's a requirement between 12 and 14 uh, 15, 14 kilowatts per rack. And only you, as an expert, who is now a company base and so on, can recommend to community to focus it to some particular size of the power supply. Because you know, in which modes, for example, Infineon, Moffat, working so fine. And only you can give a very brilliant advice to the community, hey guys, need to focus on five per two kilowatts supplier. It's much more valuable. Please split it everything for the two power zone instead of one because there's efficient from the cost standpoint and from the efficiency because everybody in that room, customers, suppliers and so on, really to pay for one percent efficiency what he in the past. So much pay because electricity one of the biggest expense. And only you and component manufacturers can help us to, to take a more efficient power supply and you try to listen from us we are like to listen from you <laughs> so so i i absolutely agree that that those of us that are in power supply design we understand the the nuances and the the challenges associated with power supply designs and and as participants in this in this forum you know that's that's what artisan and and the other power supply uh, developers bring and we certainly you know, I, I welcome the discussion as a, as a place where we can say, hey, you know, if, if we want to get another half percent out uh, of efficiency out of the, the, the supply, this is what it means, right, in terms of, of uh, you know, relative complexity change or density or whatever. At the same time, um, we don't, you know, we don't design in a vacuum either, right? There's requirements, there's, there's the server trends, there's the, the storage trends, and and there's the operational trends, right? So um, I think, you know, I've, I've designed in a vacuum before, and I'm, I'm, I've designed in, in uh, open forums before, and I really believe in, in the, the strength of, of open, open communities for developing industry, you know, industry ecosystems. So. Super, Doug. I appreciate that. Um, so we're, we're out of time. So okay. thanks, thanks, Doug. Appreciate Thank you all. Very much. So we'll start the next one in five minutes.
so I don't have to advance for you. All right. Okay. So I went ahead and turned it on. Okay, I think uh, we're ready to start the next one. If everybody kind of find your seats, and so, all right, thank you. All right. Okay, so next up we've got uh, Robert Gendron. You want to come up and uh, start away? Can we get started? Hey, yes, yeah, thanks. All right, super. So uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Robert Gendron. I'm from Vicor. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, 48 volts going uh, mainstream um, within the data centers, specifically our solution, which is um, 48 volt direct to CPU. Now, um, I know last year there was announcements of 48 volts at OCP. This year we've seen um, several new product announcements, uh, obviously many uh, conversations about 48 volts, presentations. Um, for us at Vicor, we've had 48 volt solutions and supplying 48 volt solutions for over 10 years. So we welcome uh, the um, attention 48 volts is now getting within the OCP world and how it's being embraced. So it's a very interesting time for us. Um, we are actually on our fourth generation of product so again, over that 10 years, we've been refining our product, and I'll show you a little bit of even where we're going um, in the future with it, okay? So if you don't mind, yeah. next slide, please. So I appreciate not everyone in the room uh, eats and sleeps power as we do at Vicor. Uh, so uh, just to back up a little bit, um, give you a little uh, background where we are. So what is the need for 48 volts within a data center? So simply enough, right? You've, I'm sure you've heard already, right? Rack power is increasing. Rack power is increasing because CPUs, GPUs, ASICs, those power demands are increasing, right? We've seen with our customer base where 100 amps was required a few years ago, we're seeing now power requirements of 200 amps, 300 amps, 400 amps, okay? Not only is the power, power requirements increasing, but the power complexity is increasing. That is, uh, the transient performance of these devices is increasing. The voltage to supply to these uh, GPUs is decreasing. You'd think that would be easier, but it's actually much harder. So we are talking sub one volt delivery of 200, 300, 400 amps at very high speeds. So power complexity has dramatically increased. So all this, when you look at the conventional 12 volt type delivery, makes that the, the conventional 12 volt delivery can't keep up. It falls out of pace. It can't keep up in the power delivery requirements. It can't keep up with the efficiency needs going forward, okay? So if you go to the next slide, please. So this slide, and apologize, we're using PDFs, so we couldn't have things flying in and evaporating and all, but this slide uh, highlights both 
at a high level, the benefits and the adoption delays of 48 volts. So the benefits of 48 volts, the primary one always talked about is it's a 16x reduction in power loss over 12 volts. And simply enough, what that means is it's the distribution losses or the I squared R losses in the lines, in the cables, et cetera. Okay? So those are distribution losses. Okay? Now last year, uh, when Google made their announcement here at OCP, I think they cited a 30% savings overall in what they're doing. Okay? So that included distribution losses, converter uh, efficiency gains, et cetera. Okay? Some of the other benefits of using 48 volts, it relieves the front end from converting down to 12 volts to converting to 48. It also helps in the energy storage as far as flexibility and options there. But talking about the adoption delays that I've listed here, you scroll up just a, a hair. So these are the delays, and I put in parentheses, they're historical. Because most of these now are gone. And now, now we start getting into the realm of the benefits of 48 volts and the operation of 48 volts, and now the specific implementation of Vicor's 48 volt direct to CPU. Okay? Because again, as, as you will hear from different suppliers and such, this is where there starts to be differences in the actual implementation of a 48 volt uh, VR type solution. So again, the adoption delays of the past, cost, efficiency, size, so on. But I, I can tell you today, for the, for the cost, efficiency, size, safety, reliability, and what I call the conventional comfort, you know, ease of design, everything else that goes on. At Vicor, our solution, we've either made those, those um, uh, concerns, performance parameters, either at par or we've exceeded that of the conventional 12 volt type design. Okay? So those delays are no longer in place for us. The last two, ironically, for customers to have the racks, multiple sources, et cetera, that's thanks to OCP. Right? So these delays, like I said, for us, we see as, as largely historical at this point. Okay. Go to the next slide. So the title of my presentation was, you know, 48 volts going mainstream. This is the one slide I think that embodies that the most. So as I mentioned, we've been doing 48 volts for 10 years. This is our heritage of where we've been and what we're working on even as we speak today. We have started with um, IBM processors making VR type solutions for what was the P6. And today we are actively working on P9 VR power designs. For Intel, we followed what was their VR specs, if you're not familiar, for their different platforms from VR12 starting about uh, six years ago up to today to VR13 and now their next generation of that. Not just CPUs, but we also work with various other types of ASICs, GPUs. Um, and again, I put um, kind of a basket representation up top to those. So with our solution, running at 48 volts, we're supplying various types of devices. Now this is only, I should say only, but this is CPUs, GPUs, ASICs on here. There's also memory. There's also auxiliary rails on a server board. We're also supplying those. Okay? So we can make today a server board that runs truly at 48 volts for a CPU, for memory, for every auxiliary rail that exists. Okay. So now seeing, again, where we are and stuff, let me step back and compare us uh, to a 12-volt type solution. So when we talk 12 volts, using 12 volts, you get down to powering a CPU. Now you get into the archi power architecture of what does it mean to bring 12 volts to a CPU. So there is a, a power architecture called multi-phase power scheme, which is this right here. Okay? It has been a commoditized scheme used for many years now for GPUs, CPUs, et cetera, which basically takes a buck regulator in an IC form you see here and a power inductor, and these devices are paralleled to make whatever power uh, delivery is needed for, again, a device. Okay? Again, it works, very, you know, it works well, 12 volts, it worked well for uh, smaller power processors. As you get to larger and larger or newer and newer CPUs, 
these number of stages keep adding and adding and adding to the point where, again, you really can't support that new CPU and such anymore. Now, ironically, this whole scheme was created around the whole idea of getting around the inefficiencies or the power storage or current storage that goes on within the inductor itself. Okay. Again, very good scheme, worked very well. It served its time. Now, if you scroll forward there. Now, this is in contrast to our specific, the Vicor 48 volt direct to CPU scheme. What you see right away, and I, again, I apologize, we've got bullets on here and, and some text. Right away is next to the CPU, there's only one device. This one device provides the same amount of power as those six um, multi-phase buck regulators on the previous slide. So right away you can see there's density far exceeding that of a 12 volt type design. Now, purposely up top, it's not my poor uh, slide uh, craftsmanship, there is a support device we call the PRM. And then uh, you know, the interface controller, be it SFID, PM bus, et cetera. It's purposely put up that way because it can sit quite remotely or at the board's edge compared to the VTM. So where the critical real estate is around the CPU itself, only this one device is needed. Okay. So, and I'll show you some pictures in a moment about uh, size comparisons and such, but uh, that addresses, as I mentioned, the board area consumption, again, exceeding that at 12 volts. If you read some of these bullets here, you'll see that the efficiency we can meet or surpass the efficiency of a 12 volt conversion. That is, from 12 to let's say one volt, we can beat that going 48 to one volt. So, again, one of the historical concerns is, well, I'm gonna pay the price, while I save in distribution losses, I'm gonna pay the price in conversion inefficiency. No longer is the case. Now you're actually gaining in conversion efficiency in addition to the savings and distribution losses, okay? So th several other aspects to the product that uh, again stands out, but the key one is, is that we're providing higher efficiency, higher density directly to the CPU from 48 volts, okay? Now a little bit about the design, if you just slide forward one more slide. So in the design itself, like I said, it's not a traditional buck regulator that's just paralleled up, you know, keep throwing another, another soldier at the fight. It's a very different design. It is, instead of being multi-phase, it's what we would call single-phase type design. We bring in 48 volts into a pre-regulator stage. This stage does just that. It regulates the 48 volts. So if you think of a, of a CPU or GPU that needs the margining, if the device is going from 1 to 1.1 or 1.8 to 1.7, whatever margining goes on, that's actually performed by the PRM. So this regulated bus here is a reflection of the margin voltage required at the output. So regulation is performed here and here only. That regulated voltage gets transferred over to the VTM. The VTM performs what we call voltage transformation. Knocks the voltage down multiplies the current, okay? It does not regulate. Whatever it sees here provides the transformation, thus providing either 1.8 for memory, 1.2, uh, one volt, sub one volt uh, supply to again, whatever the load is. It's a very simple, very clean design. It is not a multi-phase design. The loop is not constantly changing based on phases turning on and off, et cetera, okay? Just go to the next one. So here's an implementation of the design itself. You see the uh, VTM, as I mentioned, can be cl placed close to the socket. This is our uh, PRM, the pre-regulator stage, uh, power inductor next to it. This is uh, uh, some discretes and support, and then the SVID or PM bus controller that you would have on a board, okay? If you scroll down, there's like secret information embedded at the bottom of the page, there we go. Uh, so compared to a conventional six phase buck, uh, we measured that to be four and a half inches in area, board area consumption. Our solution, 1.75 inches. 
So again, we've reduced that critical space around the board by 60%. Now, that embodies the whole design. If you jump to the next slide. As a reminder, is only the VTM needs to be near the load. All of this can be placed far away on the edge of the board. Okay. Sorry? This would be, for example, uh, this would support like a 165 watt skew. So again, what we're talking about is not just the gaining the benefits of 48 volts, but gaining the benefits of a new architecture over what was traditionally used, being a multi-phase or 12 volt multi-phase type uh, scheme. If you would please so much to the next. So some examples of products that are out there are being released soon. So we win right here at the show. Uh, they announced uh, yesterday um, an OCS uh, compliant uh, blade. If you look, uh, you can look right in their booth and you'll see the implementation exactly what I just showed. Um, our 48 direct to the point of load solution for CPU, for memory, uh, even for some of the auxiliary rails. Okay. Another example, if you scroll forward, Inventec. Uh, they just recently did a, a, a P, IBM P9 processor design. So in this case, P9 processor, uh, I believe the load is of over 300 amps. So it required using three of our VTMs here in parallel, uh, supplying the load, and again, behind that, our PRM device uh, sitting over here. Another advantage of this, oh, no, scroll back. Mike, was I boring you on that slide? Okay, sorry. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, the design, I mean, let's take also a moment to recognize that these are easily mountable surface mount devices. Um, Again, everything is treated like a simple IC, although this is, again, creating over 300 watts of power. Okay. And you go. One last example I had in here. This is from a Japanese uh, supercomputer company. Uh, the name of the company is Pezzi, which we conveniently cut off the top. But uh, in this design, it was about a 200 plus amp design, uh, again, sub one volt. So that required two of our VTMs you see here. Again, the PRM and such uh, sits above, okay? So real designs using real products, actually, like I said, coming up on the fourth generation of product uh, with over 10 years of innovation in these devices. Okay. You... No, no, I'll scroll, I have two, three more, is that okay? Did, did you cut me off time-wise? No, no, you got, you got still another oh, 10 minutes. Oh, okay, so, are I still boring you there? Oh, sorry. Okay. So uh, a few other quick aspects. So noise in a system. As we've deployed these systems over the years, customers would come back and say, wow, the noise of that VTM is super quiet. In fact, Intel at APEC last year actually did a study. And these are not thermal plots, if you're familiar with the colors and like. This is actually uh, measured radiated noise. So on the left here is that conventional 12 volt scheme, six drivers or, or, or multi-phase bucks sitting across the top horizontally. On the right, our VTM sitting, it's very hard to see because it's in the blue body, right up towards the top center there, okay? So blue represents quiet, peacefulness. The red is, you know, it's loud, it's switching, it's creating noise, it's creating havoc, right? So again, the picture says it all, right? Multi-phase is noisy, right? The VTM is a dead quiet device. So this further adds to, to density on the board. Not only does, is the part smaller than the conventional type design, but now for routing, you can take signal lines, move it closer to the VTM, move it under the VTM, okay? If you scroll ahead. Okay, so moving forward. So, um, We've progressed in designs where now today we offer different levels of integration of what we call our PRM VTM. We have, again, as I mentioned, you've stepped top. This is one I just really kind of showed. But we uh, have options now where we can integrate the inductor into the PRM. We can even take the uh, controller, the SVID controller, and integrate that in the P, uh, PRM. So we can provide to customers a two-chip type solution. Okay. 
very easy layout, extremely high density. Okay? Now the last one is the interesting one, if you scroll up just a hair. So the last one is what we call power on package. And that is taking that VTM, which I told you is high density, low noise, high efficiency, and moving it in with the CPU. So taking it off the motherboard, putting it in with the CPU. So why would you do that? Well, if you scroll forward, in every VR design that goes on, the majority of design is focused on one aspect of a server board, and that is what's called the last inch. Okay? So that last inch in design is the most critical aspect of the design. This could be our device, our VTM here. This could be a conventional VR type design. It could be any sort of VR. But the last inch of traveling, taking high current, low voltage, going through the PCB and going up through this package is what every designer is focused on and spending the majority of time. It is what increases the board cost of every server board because you're running planes of two ounce plus copper in multiple planes to, again, reduce this resistance, reduce this impedance as low as possible, okay? In the, the package here, um, vendors are, are, are uh, consuming or dedicating a quarter to a third of their pins for power delivery up to the package, okay? So we've eliminated this last inch by taking, in essence, the VR, or specifically the VTM, and moving that in with the CPU. Okay, and I think if you scroll ahead one. So by doing this, like I said, we can eliminate the impedance contributions. We can eliminate further about 15% of power loss that goes on, okay? We can give back 99% of the package pins on the device. So CPU has 4,000 pins, 800 are dedicated to power. We can give back over 780 pins, okay? We're only providing very low current, high voltage up to the, uh, uh, the package itself, okay? So our design has primarily stayed the same as far as this PRM, VTM type concept, but as, as I've said throughout the years now, we've refined it where we can take it to finally of actually bringing on the package, eliminating that last inch. Okay. And if you go, I think I just had one last one to show. Yeah. So hopefully I conveyed in the short amount of time we had here is that, again, 48 volts is being used today, right? It's required given the processors that we see out there right now. The 48 volt conversion, the great news about 48 volt conversion is it abandons the conventional architecture of multi-phase, right? I think you'll hear this afternoon, there's, there's other architectural solutions also. But what I know for sure is the one that we have has many advantages over, again, that traditional 12 volt conventional multi-phase, okay? And specifically, we can beat that 12 volt multi-phase over efficiency, density, and cost. And with what we're doing next of actually showing it on package, we can reduce, like I said, that last inch and, and it truly accelerate uh, time to market. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have uh, three minutes. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, that's, you own that. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I'm just curious on the explanation of what, what, what you felt got you through that not to where we are today. And then my, my more realistic question is um, in, in comparison to a, a multi-phase solution. Yep. Um, and you mentioned that you have uh, efficiencies meeting or exceeding that of your solution versus multi-phase. Yes. I'm curious, is that just peak efficiency or is that across the low curve, and, you know, particularly in the, the 
light flow in where you, want, you know you can take advantage right. of uh, you know um, like phase like scan or PCM, whatever you want to call it, to optimize efficiency for trimming the light bulbs. Okay. So uh, all right. So two part question. First part on cost. Uh, so on cost. The VTM that we have is a three-dimensional package part. I say it's a truly a three-dimensional part because we place components both on the north side, south side of a PCB over mold the package. Now, we can make that on an assembly line, right? And we can make tons of them very quickly. And we can scale that very easily because uh, the, uh, the way we actually make the individual 3D parts or 3D package parts is we make them on a larger panel. Right? We dice this panel. This is a major change from us because a few years ago, we were not focused on a panel type assembly process. We had a different assembly, different package type process. So now with this new packaging, this scales very easily for us. So this is how we're addressing costs. We're treating it much like a, we look much like a wafer house now. We're focused on wafer cost or panel cost, right? Which is driving down the cost of actually all of our products because we're driving everything on a common wafer, even though it's, it's an over-molded uh, panel. Okay, so, so hopefully I succeeded on, on your first part. On the second one, on efficiency. So efficiency, yes. So it depends on the, the, the output load. So I, you know, I have, it's not gonna be a black and white answer. I apologize for that. So uh, depending on the, the, the load, you know, 1.8, one volt, 0.8 volts, and on the load condition, yes, we can beat on peak, we can beat on full load, we can beat on light load, but not in all cases, right? Because it is a curve, and so the curves, you know, some, some will have advantages over others. Light load is a challenge, right? Because in a multi-phase, right, you can just boom, 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 shut everything down, right? But we've made advances in light load, actually, where we're at the point now that we can, we can be very close to, let's say, that single phase in a heartbeat type mode. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.